Five of 11, Catherine. So um, again, I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the Community Services Director for the Larkspur Library and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. We're here with UC Master Gardeners, Catherine Randolph and Bill Ling, who will be talking to us today about plants that we bought that were really tiny that grew to really big things. So um, I'm gonna hand this over to you, Catherine. Okay, great. Thanks, Franklin. You're welcome. So welcome everybody. Um, I see a couple of people I know on the list, which is great. Um, let's see, I need to close that because nobody else needs to see that. Okay, so um, during the class today, uh, um, well, first of all, yes, I'm Catherine Randolph. I'm a Master Gardener. I'm the founder of the uh, Master Gardeners Pruning Guild. And my partner in crime today is Bill Lang. He's also a Master Gardener and a member of the Pruning Guild. Um, so during class today, we'll be saying trees, but when we say trees, we mean trees, woody shrubs, and woody vines. Um, and we're going to ask for questions after each section. Um, we want you to please confine your questions to general topics about the subject. So uh, at the end of the class, Bill and I will stay on and we can answer specific questions about your garden, but we want to keep it general during as we're going along. Um, okay. So advice to grow by Master Gardeners is uh, we are trained by a U University of California Cooperative Extension. Uh, we're volunteers who share our knowledge and our skills with the public. Um, and we're a great source for gardening information. We have a great website. We'll touch on that at the end. Um, and it's very useful. Um, and we have, there are two handouts, as Franklin said, that are available and they um, list the UC website as well as a lot of other resources. So, um, Bill, you're up. Very good. So here's what we'll be talking about uh, today. We'll cover uh, what purpose that you hope to accomplish with your tree or shrub. shrub. Um, the critical elements of site evaluation that are necessary to um, uh, have success with your new uh, plant, selecting plants at the nursery, again, a critical component for success, how to plant uh, your new tree and uh, stake it so that through its early uh, growth, it will be a healthy tree and uh, uh, properly irrigating that tree and then a little bit about pruning um, your, your young tree. Um, on the next slide. Um, first, I think that considering the purpose of your tree or shrub is something that um, few of us do enough of. So we're going to encourage you to stop for a moment and think, what is it that you might want? So for example, on the next slide, might it be a privacy a hedge in this case from shrubs from these beautiful uh, camellia plants in bloom? Uh, or might it be shade <laughs> from this wonderful uh, big old tree where you might sit on a hot summer day and have a lemonade? Um, next slide shows an incredibly beautiful maple tree where uh, the thing that you might want is the purpose of your tree is a uh, beautiful focal point uh, in your yard. Or perhaps you would want a beautiful Japanese magnolia and have flowers be the, the, the central purpose for planting your tree. Um, and then finally, in this uh, particular list of fruit, many, many of uh, our um, fellow master gardeners and the people that we talk to want fruit um, from their trees. So another very common um, uh, reason or purpose for planting your trees. Okay, so next, next we're going to talk about site evaluation. So um, I know that a lot of us do impulse purchases when we go to the nursery. So this whole class is about how to avoid the mistakes that come up with that. And so the first thing to do is you want to look at the site where you want to plant something. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, site evaluation, you want to look at the size of the space that you have available. So trees are genetically programmed to grow to a specific height and width. And you can prune them if you want, but they're going to try to get, they're still going to try to get to that height. Um, and you also, you know, pruning is stressful for trees. And it's, if you can avoid that, I mean, the, you know, you do want to do some structural pruning on most trees, but eventually you, eventually you want them to get to their full size. 
Um, so you wanna, again, looking at the size of the space, obviously neither one of these trees were, uh, um, neither, nobody thought about the size that these trees would get to eventually, um, which is why this class is called, but it was so small when I bought it. I mean, you can foresee what's gonna happen if you're thinking about it before you go there. Um, you don't wanna plant it too close to the house. You don't wanna plant it in, uh, along under the roof. Um, especially because of our risk of fire, you don't want to plant it so it's going to be right over the roof. Um, you want to look at what your climate zone is. So there's two uh, maps for climate zones. One's the USDA one and the other one is sunset. This is a picture of the sunset one. And again, the links for these sites are available in the resource list. And you can see how um, these um, the zones are attuned to um, whether a site freezes uh, for the most part. And so you can see that there's a lot of different zones around here. And if you look at the, um, uh, for Southern Marin, you can see we're 15 to 16 in there. And, but then there's also microclimates. So where I am, um, I'm in Strawberry and I face South. And um, so the climate that I have on the uh, sunny side of my house is different than what I have on the North side of my house. Um, you might have areas of your, um, your garden which get more wind. Um, a lot of my clients are down in the valley, so it's more, they're more likely to freeze down there. Um, I have a client in San Rafael. She, gets a lot of, uh, she has a lot of uh, fruit trees that most people can't grow because they're planted on the south side of her house facing south. And so there's a lot of reflected heat from the, uh, from the house. Um, so sun. Uh, almost always on a tag on a tree, you will see that it's either full sun, part sun, or, or full shade. Full sun means a minimum of six hours. So it doesn't matter if you have three hours of a lot of sun right in the middle of the day. That's not going to be enough sun for a plant that needs full sun. Um, and so part shade is going to be the, that realm in there of uh, three to six hours. Full shade is less than three hours a day. So a lot of your full shade plants, some of them can do an east, eastern facing site where they get the morning sun, which is pretty mild, and then it goes, uh, get shady after that. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so again, looking at climate. So um, this is a picture of sunburn bark on the left. So this is a tree that, you know, you may have, uh, if, if they had wrapped it, it probably wouldn't have burned. Um, or if they had made sure that the branches over it were shading it, it wouldn't have burned. Uh, this is a citrus tree on the right uh, that froze. Um, it looks like they tried to cover it. It looks like that was a cover there, but it wasn't enough. <clears throat> um, water availability. So this is an issue that may not have been something we thought about before, but now we're beginning to think about it because of climate change. So more and more, we're encouraging people to move to drought tolerant plants um, because we're gonna, the possibility exists of us having less and less water available for irrigation. Your natives and your Mediterranean plants require less water. Um, the Master Gardener's website has a lot of information about drought tolerant plants. So it's a great resource. Uh, will the tree be next to a lawn? Um, so this is kind of problematic because it's um, possible in the future that we will not be allowed to have lawns. Um, and so you don't want to, uh, a lot of people last year cut off the irrigation to their lawns, not realizing that the tree nearby or the shrubs nearby were depending on that water. So it really stressed them out. So something to think about. Okay, what type of soil do you have? So most of our um, gardens here in Marin are clay soil which is very small particles um, and their um, clay soils are um, high in mineral content. So that means oftentimes we don't need to feed as much as you would if you were, had sandy soil. Um, and they also have a tendency to hold on to moisture more than a sandy soil would. Um, let me just touch bases here. Um, Some of the websites that are listed on the handout um, talk about different kinds of soil and uh, different kinds of requirements, such as that some plants um, are very tolerant to salt uh, in the, you know, like at, at near beach or at Stenson, and some, some are not. So again, soil type, so mostly clays, 
Um, some plants need acidic soil. So the clay soils are more alkaline. The plants that need acidic soil and fertilizer are rhodes, camellias, azaleas, and your citrus. Um, if you're getting yellowing leaves on those plants or they're not doing well, you want to get some acidic fertilizer. Uh, most of your citrus requires citrus food, which is an acid fertilizer, but it also is high in micronutrients, which the citrus trees need. Um, let's see. Um, so you want to do your research first. So you've decided on a site. You know what the climate is for that site. The, these are websites, again, listed on the handouts that go into more specifics about what different trees need. And some of them, like Monrovia, you can search for certain sizes. You can search, search for um, you know, the amount of water that something needs. Um, the select tree for, from Cal Poly um, goes into a lot of detail as well, including salt. Um, Devil Mountain is now, uh, they used to be just in the East Bay. They now have a North Bay location and they have a website where you can do some searching. You can also call your, call your local nurseries. They're a great resource, Sloats, West End, Armstrong, et cetera. Um, and they can advise you on what plants will do well here. Um, so you wanna look at, will, the, will it fit your space? Is it messy? Um, you don't want a fruiting olive tree or a fruiting plum tree uh, along the sidewalk. Um, some trees, like your sycamores, which are planted along the street a lot, uh, lift the sidewalk all the time. Why they still plant them is a mystery to me. Um, is it invasive? You, moderate, you don't want to plant Monterey pines, palm trees, brooms are all examples of um, garden trees that have gotten uh, gone wild. And you want to find out if it's hard to grow. You can have a much more fun garden experience if it's something that's fairly easy to grow. And you'll know that if you see it um, around when you're driving around Marin, if you see the plant in somebody else's garden and it's doing well. Like for instance, hop seed is a plant that is planted often, but you don't really see it very happy. Uh, it's a very difficult plant to grow. <clears throat> um, do you want deciduous or evergreen? You know, if you're going for privacy, then you're gonna want evergreen. Is it fast or slow growing? Um, you know, do you care about that? Um, is it going to block the winter light? Um, you know, I like having deciduous trees on the south side of my house because then I get the, the uh, winter, winter sun. Um, maple trees are one that we oftentimes really emphasize the winter silhouette. Once they drop their leaves, they've got a really beautiful structure um, and colorful foliage, etc. And then you can also look at shape. Uh, you know, your Italian cypress trees, very vertical, very upright. Um, uh, some things, you know, some sites you're going to want something that's much more broad. Uh, okay, any questions so far? Franklin, I think we have one in the chat. Yeah, there's one. Monrovi is not East Coast based. My friend works here in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, but however, the website is tilted towards uh, West Co East Coast plants. Um, so I hear what you're saying, and they do have growing grounds here, but in general, when you look at the website, they're more tilted towards the East. Okay, I think, Bill, you're on. Yeah, thank you. So when you go to the nursery, um, don't succumb to that endorphin rush. In other words, <clears throat> don't go to that tree that is this wonderfully appealing tree that just tosses all of your wonderful research out the window. <clears throat> You've hopefully already decided whether you want a deciduous uh, or an evergreen trees and let that be your guide and don't uh, and, and stick to your guns unless you wanna go back and reevaluate. Um, Read the read the tag. Let's can we go back a, a slide? Yeah, um, make certain that you read the tag and and know what the water needs and sun needs and and the height and width of the tree are. And again, don't succumb to that endorphin rush. Make sure that you uh, go back, read that tag. Water needs, sun needs, height and width, and try and be disciplined and and remember whether or not that suits your site. This is one of the biggest mistakes I think that people need or uh, make rather. Go ahead. Not us though, Bill and I never do that. <laughs> 
And when you're there, <clears throat> take a look at how this uh, plant has been handled. Does it look like a telephone pole? In other words, has, been, has it been planted too deep in its container? Or can you see a little bit of the root flare? You can see um, in the lower left there uh, how pretty uh, that root flare is as opposed to uh, the uh, quote telephone post uh, appearance. So look to see how well that plant has been uh, cared for uh, in its pot. Um, also uh, at the nursery, uh, b before I, there's one other point I wanted to make about the, uh, the way the trees are uh, in their pots, which is ask the nursery attendant if they actually will uh, turn the plant upside down so that you can see the roots. And that's gonna come uh, again, we'll see a little bit better in an upcoming slide. In the next slide, we can talk a little bit about the structure uh, of the tree. And in particular, um, look for branches that are well spread, a good single dominant um, uh, main trunk and one thing to look at and try to avoid is this uh, uh, co-dominant leaders, where you see there's a very narrow um, uh, angle between these two co-dominant leaders. These are highly likely to split. Uh, they're very subject to, uh, uh, you know, a windy situation, for example, or a, a highly uh, rainy situation where leaves are loaded. These are uh, uh, subject to splitting and breaking. Uh, next slide. In terms of the other structural uh, aspects, you want to avoid a plant that has crossing branches that will rub against and, and uh, create wounds uh, as they grow. But it also creates a very confusing uh, look. And um, most of us will take a look at this and say, what? it's confusing. Uh, it's just not a pleasing look. And um, if a plant looks like this and, and when you go to the nursery, I think you'll find some plants that are not nearly as mature uh, and in fact are young plants, but that they're just plain confused. They've got um, branches going every, every which way. Now there's some plants that are like that, but uh, in general, when you're, when you're purchasing a tree, it should not um, uh, have all of this confusion. <clears throat> yeah, as I mentioned earlier, have the, the, the nursery attendant lift the <clears throat> plant the tree out of its container. Uh, if you find girdling roots or <clears throat> a plant that has large uh, roots that have circled themselves within the container, which is natural if they stay in a container for too long, both will result <clears throat> in poor vigor, a tree that's unable to anchor itself, and a, a tree that simply will not be able to put spread its roots out. These roots are, are, are fixed where they are and will not grow well. So the next slide, <clears throat> here's what you will look for on the right hand, a, a good, nice, evenly balanced, fine uh, uh, roots and a couple of larger roots um, uh, that you can see uh, on the surface. So that's a, a nice, pretty plant uh, from inside the pot. So questions again at uh, this point? So the one in the chat is, of how about fire safe considerations? Italian cypress is not recommended to plant because it's fire prone. No, I wouldn't plant it. Um, but that was just an example of a, of a vertical, a shape of tree. Yeah, no junipers, no cypress. Yeah, that's a different class. Yeah, so for there's no other questions now. So. Okay. Okay, planting your tree. So um, the best time to plant a tree is in winter when it's dormant. Um, you can't always do that, but you really want to avoid the hot summer months because it's very stressful for a plant to have to um, uh, put on roots when um, it's also uh, losing a lot of water through its leaves. So much of your root growth happens in the winter. So you know that the on a deciduous tree that they, they leaf out in the spring, they um, have leaves all summer, and then they start to drop their leaves in the fall. Well, the root growth happens mostly in the winter and then uh, starts to slow down when it gets into the growing season. Um, and don't plant when the ground is really wet. If you're walking around and digging around in the soil when it's really wet, especially with our clay soils, it really compacts the soil 
And um, soils need to have both air and water. And if you step on the soil and you compact it, there's no air in there. So that really uh, suffocates the roots. Um, if you buy a plant, you're gonna wanna keep it moist and shaded until it goes in the ground. Um, you don't wanna leave it out in a hot pot. They also dry out really much faster in, in the heat. Um, before you plant, you wanna make sure that the pot, uh, the soil in the pot is not super dry. So if when you water a pot, the water sits on the top, that means that the soil's gotten super dry and uh, that the soil is beginning to repel water. So you can water all you want, but the water is going to run right through and not soak into the soil. So you can either soak it overnight in a bucket um, and you'll know that it's super dry because when you put it in the bucket, you'll start getting air holes or air bubbles coming up through the soil. Or you can take um, dish soap and drop, do a little drops of dish soap around it and then water it. So dish soap is a surfactant, and so it breaks down that resistance to moisture in the soil, and then it starts absorbing. I would still sit it in a saucer, um, but that happens to me a lot, especially now that my irrigation's turned off, I'm having to rely more on hand watering for my pots. Um, but before you plant, you don't wanna put it in the ground super dry because then it's not gonna connect with the soil that's around it. It's gonna really have a problem. Um, you're wanting to develop a root plate that is very wide. So this is um, uh, an example. Bartlett has a thing called, tree, tree companies have a thing called an air, sp air spade where they can excavate the roots like this, which is just amazing without damaging them. Um, so you want, you want your root plate to be very wide because it's gonna give structural stability to the plant. And um, it's also going to have a larger area of, uh, to draw from in case we have a drought or there's an irrigation failure. Um, some plants end up with just a very small root ball and um, it's very hard to keep that irrigated. Um, so this is available as the handout. Uh, so you can um, take this home with you. Um, so the hole should, allow the soil level of the finished planting to be three inches above the gr uh, grade. Okay, and that's to um, make sure that it allows for settling because after you finish planting, it's gonna settle. But also when you place your two inches of mulch, it's not gonna come up over the crown. So when you're digging your hole, you do not want to dig, or, dig it deeper than the root ball. A lot of people will dig this big hole, they mix all the soil up, they'll plant it, everything's level, and then it sinks because it, the soil compacts. And then the crown gets covered and then the tree rots. Um, you wanna dig it three times as wide as the pot and you wanna mix the native soil with your planting mix. So you don't want a soil horizon between the native soil and the planting hole because the roots will, they're very happy in this planting mix that you've got and they start going out and they hit that clay wall and they go, eh, and they don't like it so much. So they start circling. So you really have a plant in the ground, but in a pot. It's, pot, it's gonna get pot bound over time. So you wanna mix the native soil with the planting mix and then you wanna make holes in the edge of the soil. So the roots have ways, holes to get in, start to get in and infiltrate the soil around them. Um, Let's see, I think that covers most of that. Um, if, if you have somebody planting trees for you and they plant it too deep, make them dig it up and replant it. Um, really, I, I had a new, a new client over uh, on Sycamore, uh, a 20, 20 foot maple tree in the backyard. They love it, it's been there for years um, and uh, the, it's buried too deep and the crown is rotting and they have to, it's gonna die soon. It's just not worth it. And it may take years for it to happen, but why go there? Um, so again, we talked about cutting the roots. Bill talked about cutting the roots. Um, so you wanna cut like at least a half inch so that those roots, when they start to grow, they know that they can now move out. They don't need to continue circling. Um, so after you've planted this, the tree, you wanna tamp it down a little bit, not too much. And then you wanna water it thoroughly. You can put this temporary berm around it as a way to retain the water and keep the water around the roots as you're starting to water it. And then you're gonna mulch with two inches of mulch, but the mulch needs to stay 12 inches away from the crown of the tree 
so that it doesn't um, uh, get crown rot. Okay, uh, let's see, that's that. So staking, think, I'll take over from here. Yep. <clears throat> staking is um, something that's done at the nursery improperly because it's serving a, a different purpose at the nursery than it is when you put your tree in the ground. <clears throat> the, from the nursery, the stakes are put up so that the trees simply don't break. So they need to be tied tightly to the trunk so that these guys can toss the trees off and on the trucks. Um, but <clears throat> when you get them home and you plant the tree, install two stakes perpendicular to the wind. In other words, so when the wind blows, uh, it's blowing a across these two stakes. Um, <clears throat> this allows movement to strengthen the, the trunk. If the trunk is held tight, it doesn't realize that it needs to develop strength in, in, mo in both or really all four directions. <clears throat> the two ties should be uh, in a figure eight and they should be as low as possible to still uh, uh, provide the support for the tree to stand vertical. They should be removed in one to two years <clears throat> as soon as the tr uh, tree is stable in the ground. And <clears throat> there's no magic way of determining that. You just have to go and, uh, and wiggle the tree and, and be confident that that tree will not fall over when you uh, remove the stakes. Um, next I, I want to say yeah, one thing about that, which is one way you can tell that it, it's getting ready is that if you wiggle the trunk, you'll see that the soil doesn't move. If you're yeah. wiggling the trunk and the, the soil is still moving a little bit, it hasn't rooted in firmly in your yes. place. Thank you. <clears throat> so here uh, is an example of a stake that wasn't removed. And you can see that um, this is called girdling. Uh, the, here the, the stake has uh, actually prevented growth and can girdle or uh, remove the ability of nutrients to flow uh, up uh, through the outer sections of the tree. So <laughs> using broad ties or something like jute string uh, can help uh, with a loosener, uh, a looser uh, way of, of holding the tree. Uh, wire or zip ties that are narrow uh, can, uh, actually promote um, this girdling and can kill the top of the tree above where uh, it was staked. So check your ties uh, at least a couple of times a year to make sure that they're not strangling uh, your tree. <clears throat> now, irrigation. That wonderful photograph that Catherine showed you a moment ago uh, gives you a much better idea uh, of how trees develop their roots in order to maximize the uptake of moisture. Uh, in mature trees, most of the feeder roots are in the top 12 inches of the soil, and most of them are within the area of the crown of the tree, uh, around, the, uh, around the drip line, and uh, in particular uh, within uh, the, the, about half the distance between the trunk and, and the drip line. <clears throat> On the next slide. <clears throat> the best form <clears throat> of irrigation lines are half inch inline drip and arranged in the spiral around the base of larger trees and shrubs. <clears throat> Some people do use a quarter line, a quarter inch line, but it's quite subject to damage. Um, people stepping on it inadvertently, um, uh, cutting the line with a damage with a uh, shovel. Um, but those of you that have used quarter inch line know that um, it's uh, quite quite easy to, to cut the line or otherwise damage it. When the half inch drip line is arranged properly, and I'll show you that in a moment, it encourages root, it encourages roots to move outward and to form a wide root plate. Don't use sprayers because they can uh, moisten the bark above the crown uh, and don't use two emitters at the base because the roots will grow right to those two emitters and will not develop a, a, a wide plate. Initially, make sure that the soil is wet to a full 12 inches deep. Uh, and on the next slide, 
um, it, you can see that uh, structure of, of the half inch spiral uh, irrigation hose. Usually the trees need irrigation for uh, the first three years. And this is quite variable depending on the trees, including um, uh, more drought tolerant trees. But I think you need to expect that those first few years you will need irrigation while the tree uh, and the, the root structure establishes itself. Young trees need consistent irrigation, which is to say they need to be irrigated uh, every uh, week or two or three, depending on the conditions in the soil. Um, and it's important to check the, your whole irrigation system twice a year, because in particular with trees, um, they may not reflect uh, uh, drought stress as, as readily as uh, some of your other more tender plants. And by the time they're reflecting stress, they um, um, might be very stressed, in fact. In general, once these trees are a little bit more established, it's better to water long uh, and deep and less frequently. And that enc encourages these uh, broader roots and, and uh, deeper roots. Okay, <clears throat> pruning, Catherine. Oh, we, let's see, excuse me, there's one more of these irrigation slides. And this is what I mentioned about um, irrigating uh, even established trees, especially in drought um, and especially in late summer uh, and fall. And I would imagine all of you now have uh, seen trees that um, are beginning to look like the one in the photograph. Um, <clears throat> when we see these long periods of drought uh, that, that we've been seeing, um, the roots begin to dry out and simply can't supply uh, adequate water for the tree. This can take uh, quite a bit of time to develop and in turn, it can take years for trees to recover and in fact, some of them simply don't. When the rains do start, it's important to remember that it takes multiple rains over a period of weeks um, before uh, much of that water soaks through and gets down to any uh, meaningful depth. And uh, I'm sure that many of you who put a, uh, a shovel on the ground uh, after a good long rain have been delighted to find that first inch or two nice and, and, and damp and then get down to six or so inches and to find it absolutely bone dry. And the next slide. Uh, yeah, I want to say one more thing about this, which is that, so you see on this, these trees at the top of the trees have died back. So there is actually a column of water that goes from the tip of a root all the way up to the main roots, up to the trunk, all the way out to the lateral branches. So there's a column of continuous water all the way to the, to the leaves. And so when we have a drought and the water is not coming up from the root tips and that column of water breaks, um, that's why the top dies out first, because the water is no longer getting up there to the top. Um, and I participated in a conversation, um, this must have been about six months ago, um, Bay Area Tree Mortality Task Force, and it included people from um, Bartlett Tree, from UC Cooperative Extension, and from the heads of all the regional parks around the Bay Area. And what they're seeing all over the Bay Area because of the extended drought, because of the effects of smoke and ash um, and climate change, increased heat, is uh, tree mortality of all species, almost all species. Um, and, you know, Monterey Pines is obvious. We know that that's happening, but they're seeing that our native bay trees, um, Monterey Cypress, Monterey Pine, um, almost all the trees, the oaks, I think, might be a, an exception to that uh, because they're so drought tolerant. But we're going to be losing a lot of our trees if the drought conditions continue, which it looks like they're going to do. Um, so, and it's something to think about again. I'm going to talk in a minute about triage in your garden. But I mean, as you drive around, you can see redwood trees that are dying. You can see um, the Monterey pines obviously are continuing to die. There was actually a, a dying acacia on the freeway um, between Mill Valley and Corte Madeira. Um, so it's going to be a continuing issue. <clears throat> so I wanted to touch a little bit on irrigation. So um, the water district, when they started the regulations last summer, um, the first thing they did was to ban sprinklers. 
And um, there are actually different types of sprinklers. A lot of people have the micro sprayers. I see them in gardens all the time. They're very ineffective. A lot of the um, water emitted by the micro sprayers evaporates in the air or gets blown, you know, if there's any kind of wind at all. You want water in the roots of the plants. You don't want the water in the air. So an alternative is the MP rotators. Um, and you can see that picture there on the left. So first of all, it, the, um, the water is rotated. So it doesn't build up and puddle in one spot. Um, and the uh, second thing is that the rotators have larger drops. And so the drops are more likely to drop into the soil rather than to evaporate in the air. So if you're gonna have to go that direction, um, be very conscious. Uh, on the list, uh, on the resource list, I list all the um, irrigation stores in the county. Almost all of them have classes. Um, irrigation can be, you know, the basics of it can be um, fairly easy and you can do it yourself if you want to, or you can, they also have referrals uh, of people who can do the irrigation for you. Um, one of, I work with a landscaper who oftentimes take a, takes over large gardens and um, the first thing she does is go through and troubleshoot the entire irrigation system, converting everything to drip if she can. Um, and the second thing she does is start feeding plants. And um, every time I start working with her in a new garden, I see, um, I see in this second and third year an increase in the plant growth. Um, I just worked at a garden. I've been working there for six years. Last year, we troubleshot the irrigation. All of a sudden, all these maple trees have, you know, two to four feet of growth that they have not had in the past year. So your irrigation is critical, particularly in a drought. Um, get a professional to come in and do troubleshoot irrigation. Make sure you check it twice a year. Um, hopefully, if you have um, any size of garden, you have an irrigation clock. clock. Um, there are smart clocks now. They um, usually can handle multiple stations, which you want because you're going to have your microclimates. So an area of full sun is going to want to be um, uh, programmed differently than a place of full shade. You can set the times, the number of days, um, and intermittence for each zone. Um, they track the weather. So they uh, connected to the internet. They can tell whether it's rain. They can tell whether there's uh, high temperatures and adjust accordingly. So I might have one valve set for 20 minutes. And so if it rains, it'll turn the whole system off. Um, if it gets really hot, you know, in the summer, you know, in the hot summer days, it's gonna be watering at 100%. And if it's very cloudy and it's cool, it's gonna cut it down to 50%. So it automatically adjusts that so you don't have to think about it so much. Um, I realized last summer when we shut off uh, this, this winter, when it rained, I assumed that my smart clock had shut off the irrigation. But after a couple of weeks, I realized it had come on again because it didn't realize that the soil was still moist. So you need to add a soil moisture sensors to your irrigation system so that it takes in not only the weather, whether it's rained in the last month or whatever, but also how moist the soil is. Because remember, our clay soil uh, retains moisture for a longer period of time. And all of these clocks you can program from your PC or from your uh, cell phone. So um, I thought about drought in our garden. So you might want to wait to plant until we see what's happening, especially if you're thinking about planting something that takes more water. Um, if we continue in drought conditions, which it looks like we are right now, there's no rain forecast for the next 10 days. And I think they're not predicting anything this month. Um, uh, we are going to need to triage our gardens. So which plants are most important to you? Which plants can you do without? You know, if you have a small shrub, um, you that's going to be easier to replace than a large tree. So for me, my trees are most important and that's what I'm going to focus on. Which plants need the most water? I have a, a birch grove, which I did not plant. It was here when I moved in. Very high water plant. Um, I'm thinking about putting in a, um, um, a gray water system to, to water just that area. Um, there's a lot of complications on gray water systems, but that's a perfect situation for it. It's a high water plant. Um, gray water needs to be put right out into the garden. It can't be stored. So again, only use inline drip and mulch, mulch, mulch. 
because it preserves the moisture in the soil. Um, okay, let's see. Young tree pruning. So when you get a tree, it's okay to cut out right away all the dead and damaged uh, branches. Um, and I would discourage you from doing any other pruning until they've usually started pushing new growth. So remember, the first year they're going to be working on their roots. And once they've got the roots going, then they're going to start be pushing new growth. <clears throat> um, you want to, even though you know that in the future that tree is going to have the lowest branch is going to be quite high, when it's first planted, you want to preserve those lower branches because those branches, branches feed the trunk nearest them. Okay, so the carbohydrates that they create go to that area of the trunk. And in the beginning, you're wanting that trunk to grow. So trees have two forms of growth. One is primary growth, which is on the, the leaves and on the tips of the branches. The second is the secondary growth, which is the expansion of the caliper or the, the width of the trunk. So if you keep those lower branches, you can shorten them if you want, if they're getting in the way, but keep them there until you've got a good sturdy uh, tree. You can also hire an aesthetic pruner from the Aesthetic Pruners Association, and that is again on the resource list. Um, and they can advise you. Um, okay, so I think we've covered all our bases here. We've talked about the purpose of the tree, um, how to evaluate the site of where we want to put the tree, um, how to research the right tree for the spot, what to do when you go to the nursery, how to plant it, how to stake it, how to irrigate it, and how to prune it. So I think we covered a lot of bases. Um, so this is the resource list. Um, and it covers a lot of information there. Um, and I think that's it. So if you do have questions, you can either use the Q&A or put it in the chat box. Hey, there's still no questions. <laughs> oh, here comes one. Um, yeah, the, um, it went out with the email and I'll send it out again with the link to the recording. So the um, resources will be available. And when does the Japanese maple have a large root plate? Say that again. So does the Japanese maple have a large root plate? All large trees have a large root plate. Okay. And then someone's asking for a placement of soil sensors. Um, interesting question. Um, you know, don't have a lot of experience yet. I'm just putting a soil sensor in, but you could ask at, you know, Urban Farmer or Water Savers or any of those places. Um, if you put it in a sunny area, the soil is going to dry, dry, dry out there faster. Um, and if you put it in a shady area, that opposite actually. So you might want to put it in a sunny area because you're going to have trees in the sunny area. They're going to need water before the shady area. And someone's asking, are, the webs are there websites that can help with choosing trees for climate change? Um, uh, most of the websites on that list will talk about water needs. And some of them actually will specifically say drought tolerant. You can also look at, you know, most of your, look at the where the plants come from originally. Sometimes you can tell that, or sometimes you know that. So that's why the Australian natives are really drought tolerant um, because they they have a very um, hot environment. So um, a lot of your cactus obviously are drought tolerant. Um, and you should also be, be able to find information about that on the Master Gardener's website. And on the internet. It's actually quite easy to find in, uh, information on the internet. <clears throat> and uh, there are several wonderful websites. For example, the Missouri Bo Botanical Garden uh, has a wonderful website. <clears throat> okay, and then someone's asking, um, their neighbor wants to prune their redwood tree that hangs over the fence. Um, I don't want to damage, um, damage to the tree. What can, I, what can his tree service do to prevent damage? Pruning a redwood tree, and in for what purpose? Uh, what's the purpose of pruning? 
Well, no, it sounds like it's part of it's hanging over the, the fence. So they want to um, prune it, but he's trying to prevent damage to the tree. So how do you prevent damage to the redwood tree? <laughs> Uh, a good, well-qualified arborist uh, should be more than capable of, of pruning appropriately, uh, causing minimum damage to the tree. So if you hire uh, uh, any of the uh, arborists that have certified arborists um, doing the work, then you should feel comfortable. Now, I, I, I'm presuming, are they lifting the skirt of this tree or uh, windowing it? I presume they're not reducing the height. I mean, um, Fernanda, would you put that in the, in the chat box? <laughs> or does I, did I answer the question? Well, I'm not sure. That's why I gotta see if, um, if Fernanda's happy with the answer or not, so. So yeah, so let me just say something about that, which is um, I have a redwood tree in the property line between me and a neighbor and it has been topped for decades and it just keeps coming up. So there's, if a, if a redwood tree is happy, which is to say it's well irrigated, um, it's getting enough sun, you could do almost anything to it and it won't hurt it. Um, obviously I would not top it if I, you know, but if I don't top it, I don't have a view and the neighbor won't let me take the tree out. So. Um, but they're very you know, happy. Redwood is very vigorous and you can hardly do anything to it that would hurt it. And again, an arborist is the answer to that question. Okay, and then someone um, wants to know if we, I think your contact information was on the handout, right? Or, or not? The contact information for what? For, they're asking for your contact information. So would, would, um, you, would just put it or just refer them back to the Master Gardeners um, website. Yeah, I think they have to go back to Master Gardeners. Okay, and then um, someone's asked, what percentage of potting soil to mix in a planting hole to minimize sinking? Okay, so there's a difference between potting soil and planting mix. Mm -hmm. So planting mix is what you're gonna use to plant in the ground and the potting soil is obviously for potting. Um, I would do half and half. Half native soil, half planting mix. And mixed up. Yes. Yeah, um, mix them together. Okay, so uh, Fernanda followed up. So they're, they're not lowering the height, it's just the trees over his property. So that redwood is just on, on the neighbor's side of the, of the fence, so, or the branches, I guess. Yeah, so it shouldn't hurt it to cut the branches on, on his side of the fence. It might look weird, um, but it, it won't hurt it. Okay, so is there any more questions or? Okay, so, so far no more questions at this point, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you everybody. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. Take care. Thanks, Catherine. Pray Thanks, for girl. rain. <laughs> yeah, pray for rain, everybody. So, <laughs> oh, so someone's asking, what's the difference between potting and planting? I guess soil. Um, that's a good question. I imagine that plant potting soil probably has more um, uh, things like vermiculite in it um, that would keep it aerated and probably less organic material, but that's a wild guess. You'd have to ask at the nursery. It may not co actually compact as much as you would wish. Uh, potting soils are, are very, very light to allow um, tender, younger plants to, to survive. And I, I wonder if it may not compact as, uh, as much. You, do, you don't want to stomp when you plant your, your, your tree, but you do want it to, to, to be firmly um, uh, pressed and um, the potting soil may not compress as, as well. Okay, 
Okay, it seems like it. So thank you guys. Thank you, um, thank you, Catherine and Bill, for joining us today. Thanks to the Master Gardeners again for, and then everybody join us next week. We have a, a talk on planting and raising blueberries and strawberries with Judy Arsini, uh, another Master Gardener. So thank you all for attending and then just be on the lookout for the links to the recording. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you, thank Franklin. You, everybody.